Christian New Spirit family, what a blessing to be here this morning Amen. and to, to hear the bustle of little voices and the kiddos here. Uh, it's, it just, just feels vibrant and alive in here, and uh, it's a blessing. And uh, greater, have you thought about it? Greater is one day in your house than a thousand elsewhere. Amen. 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 I've spent many days outside of the Lord's house, and I would trade them off for like one day in the house of the Lord. It really is a blessing to be here with you this morning. And I'm going to ask if uh, you have your Bibles with you, if you'll turn to Jeremiah chapter 32, verses 1 through 15. Jeremiah chapter 32, verses 1 through 15. And if you find yourself, if you'll please stand in honor of God's word. <clears throat> it's great to see all of you here this morning, especially our guests. Thank you all for blessing us here. And I do want to welcome all of our online viewers as well. Thank you for making New Spirit your place of worship. 32, Jeremiah, verses 1 through 15. The word of the Lord says, The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord in the tenth year of Zedekiah, king of Judah, which was the eighteenth year of Nebuchadnezzar. At that time, the army of the king of Babylon was besieging Jerusalem, and Jeremiah the prophet was shut up in the court of the guard that was in the palace, palace of the king of Judah. For Zedekiah, king of Judah, had imprisoned him, saying, Why do you prophesy and say, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I am giving the city into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he shall capture it. Zedekiah, king of Judah, shall not escape out of the hand of the Chaldeans, but shall surely be given into the hand of the king of Babylon, and shall speak with him face to face, and see him eye to eye. And he shall take Zedekiah to Babylon, and there he shall remain until I visit him, declares the Lord. Though you fight against the Chaldeans, you shall not succeed. Jeremiah said, The word of the Lord came to me. Behold, Hanamel, the son of Shalom, your uncle, will come to you and say, Buy my field that is at Anathoth, for the right of redemption by purchase is yours. Then Hanamel, my cousin, came to me in the court of the guard in accordance with the word of the Lord. And said to me, buy my field, that is, at Anathoth, in the land of Benjamin, for the right of possession and redemption is yours. Buy it for yourself. Then I knew that this was the word of the Lord. And I bought the field at Anathoth from Hanamel, my cousin, and weighed out the money to him, 17 shekels of silver. I signed the deed, sealed it, got witnesses, and weighed the money on scales. Then I took the sealed deed of purchase containing the terms and conditions and the open copy, and I gave the deed of purchase to Baruch, the son of Neriah, son of Messiah, in the presence of Hanamel, my cousin, in the presence of the witnesses who signed the deed of purchase, and in the presence of all the Judeans who were sitting in the court of the guard. I charged Baruch in their presence, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Take these deeds, both this sealed deed of purchase and this open deed, and put them in an earthenware vessel, that they may last for a long time. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, houses and fields and vineyards shall again be bought in this land. Lord Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day and for the message you've put into my heart. May every word be yours and not mine. May those who hear it be blessed by it and receive it, Lord, with the understanding that you are speaking to us guide our thoughts, our hearts, our minds to receive your holy word. And we thank you for this privilege. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I brought an image to share with you here, uh, Sister Nellie, whenever you're ready. If you've never heard of Jack Canfield, he's the creator of the Chicken Soup for the Soul. He's also one of the leading motivational speakers in the world. And when he first attempted to publish his Chicken Soup for the Soul series, he went to over 130 different publishers, and they all turned him down. None of them were interested. They saw no value in what he was offering, and they said, no one wants to read 100 inspirational stories. And to make matters worse, after so many rejections, their agent dropped them as well, not seeing any value in what Jack Canfield had to offer. 
But Jack Canfield was determined to publish his book. And finally, their book was picked up by a small publisher in Florida. And now there are over 250 Chicken Soup for the Soul books with over 500 million copies sold worldwide. When nobody else saw the value in his product, Jack Canfield believed because he knew that this world needed uplifting and inspirational stories. Or what about John Kuhn? John Kuhn grew up in poverty in the Ukraine, but he was a brilliant software technician. So he applied at Facebook, went and interviewed, and he was almost hired, but he was passed over in the final interview. But John didn't quit because he believed in the value of what he could offer. So he designed his own software, and he founded his own company called WhatsApp. And it became so popular that he sold it to the same company that rejected him a few years earlier. And in 2014, WhatsApp sold to Facebook for $19 billion. That's billion with a B, dollars. There are going to be times in your life when others do not see the value in something that you believe in. And there's going to be times when the biggest challenge that you're going to face is to trust in a plan that nobody else believes in. When we started this church three years ago, there were numerous people that doubted what we did. There were numerous people who didn't see any value in what we were doing, who believed we were wasting our time. But the Lord elected only a few to see his vision. Only a few to see the field that we were about to purchase. And my friends, this is only the beginning. Amen. This church has got a bright future. Not because of who we are, but because of the mighty God that we serve. Amen. Amen. And if there was ever a man who experienced investing in a vision that no one else believed in, it was the prophet Jeremiah. Let's go back to Jeremiah 32. The year is 588 B.C. That's about one year before the infamous fall of Jerusalem. And we know this because in verse 1 it tells us that it was the 18th year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign. Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, the great empire of Babylon. And the 10th year of Zedekiah, the king of Judah. And I brought a map to share with you. When Zedekiah decided that there was a better plan for his nation than to pay tribute. Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians, they were the great world empire at that time. Nobody challenged them. They were the great world power. And everyone paid tribute, including Zedekiah and the kingdom of Judah. But Zedekiah thought it would be wise to withhold his tri tribute and go down to Egypt and say, hey, let's become allies, you and I, and stand up against this king Nebuchadnezzar. But it was most unwise especially because King Zedekiah did everything that was evil in the eyes of the Lord. And being unwise in what he did, Nebuchadnezzar gathered his army, an army of what we believe to be about a quarter of a million soldiers, and he marched his army west towards Judah to make an example of this rebellious nation. And as the army advanced towards Jerusalem, they laid waste to everything. And now that great and fearsome army had surrounded Jerusalem and was about to, to tear down its walls and lay siege to the city. And this is where we find Jeremiah. And we read in verses 2 through 5 that Jeremiah was imprisoned in the palace of King Zedekiah. And we're not told why. Why was he held prisoner? But we find out later in Jeremiah 37, 11, 11 to 21, that when Jeremiah went to Anathoth, the same place to go and check out the field that he was about to purchase that God told him to buy. He went to take care of family business that King Zedekiah took the opportunity to arrest him, claiming that he was trying to defect, to desert to the enemy. But this was not the truth. That was not why King Zedekiah arrested Jeremiah. The truth is that King Zedekiah didn't like what Jeremiah was preaching. Notice verses 3 through 5. When he gathers him and he, and he uh, arrests him and he brings him back to the palace, he doesn't say, hey, why are you trying to defect? Why are you trying to leave over to the enemy? He doesn't bring that up. The truth is, is he tells him, behold, Jeremiah, why do you prophesy? 
that the Lord is giving this city into the hand of the king of Babylon. I want you to imagine this scene. King Nebuchadnezzar, the king of the, the greatest empire on earth at that time, about a quarter of a million troops surrounding this city. Imagine how scary and fearful this site would have been because they know what will happen if and when Nebuchadnezzar breaks down those walls. He's not going to come in and just give them a, a rap on the knuckles. He's not going to come in and just find them. He's not going to come in and just scold them. He's going to take them, take them as refugees. He's going to take them as prisoners. He's going to take them as slaves into a foreign land and everything that they have will be given to someone else. Everything will be lost. And what does God tell Jeremiah? Jeremiah tell them, no, I'm not going to save you this time. This time, no. This judgment is for your continued rebellion. So the king imprisoned Jeremiah because he was trying to silence his preaching. Sometimes people only want to hear from God when they like what he's saying. And here Jeremiah is proclaiming to the people what they don't want to hear, and especially what the king doesn't want to hear. No, I'm not going to bail you out this time. This is for your own good, and this is my judgment. I want you to notice the divine agency at work. Notice verse 3. Why do you prophesy, Jeremiah? Behold, says the Lord, I am giving this city into the hand of the king of Babylon. Jeremiah, you tell them, yeah, that's Nebuchadnezzar sitting out there, but I could take them out with, with just one simple breath. But he's there by my own bidding. He's there by my authority. He is the one to exact judgment upon my people. Imagine how difficult that must have been to hear. Judgment had to fall on Jerusalem because it was the only way that Israel could be preserved. And this, my friends, was not popular opinion. See, Jeremiah's prophecy, it didn't coincide with the preferences of the day. Does that, does that sound familiar? It wasn't popular to preach this thing at that time. People wanted to hear something else. Does that sound familiar? But Jeremiah didn't care. Jeremiah was going to preach what God said to him and no more and no less. Jeremiah decided to preach the truth whether the people wanted to hear it or not. But then... One day, something amazing happened. I want you to notice verses 6 through 8. Jeremiah said, the word of the Lord came to me. And the Lord said to him, Jeremiah, behold, Hanamel, the son of Shalom, your, your uncle, Hanamel, your cousin, is going to come to you, and he's going to tell you, he's going to ask you, buy my field that is at Anathoth, for the right of redemption by purchase is yours. And then just as the Lord said, Hanamel, my cousin, came to me in the court of the guard in accordance with the word of the Lord and said to me, Cousin, buy my field that is at Anathoth in the land of Benjamin, for the right of possession and redemption is yours. Buy it for yourself. And then Jeremiah knew that this was the word of the Lord. One day out of the blue, God told Jeremiah, Hey, your cousin's going to come. He's going to ask you to do something that's going to sound crazy. But I want you to do it. It's not going to make any sense to you. It's going to sound ludicrous. But I want you to do it anyway. And sure enough, Hanamel comes and he says, Cousin, buy my field. By Israelite law, the land couldn't be sold to someone outside the family. The land had been given as a promise to the people of Israel. So you couldn't sell it to a foreigner when you wanted to sell a piece of property, you needed to sell it to the family. But it had to be sold to the family in order. If I have a, a piece of property in Israel and I want to sell it, I just don't go to any family member. I have to go by right of purchase to the first, maybe the, 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 the father or the brother. And then if they deny it and they don't want it, then I go to the next in line and the next in line until I find somebody in my family that will purchase my field. And Hanamel had gone through quite a few by the time he had come to Jeremiah. Jeremiah is his cousin. He had exhausted all of the 
aunts and the uncles. He had exa exhausted already all the brothers and the sisters. And now this was a latch this, the ditch effort here. Let me go to my cousin Jeremiah. Please buy this, this field for the right of redemption is yours. What happened to the others? Well, we know. There's an army surrounding the city about to lay siege. And when they tear down those walls, everything that they have will be lost. You want me to buy your field? You want me to invest in this piece of property that within a few days is probably going to be gone anyway? I don't think so. But the Lord says, no, I want you to buy that, that field. And I want you to notice verse 8. When he heard it, he knew that this was the word of the Lord. And convinced that the Lord had spoken to him, Jeremiah bought the field. He weighed out the money. Notice it was only 17 pieces of silver. Very cheap. Good deal for this. He signed the deed. He sealed it. And he got witnesses. Notice verse 12. He got the deed of purchase. And he uh, uh, there was Baruch, his, his amanuensis, his secretary. Baruch was the one that wrote down whatever prophecies that Jeremiah would speak. And he was in the presence of Hanamel, his cousin. And he was in the presence of the witnesses who signed the deed of purchase. And in the presence of all the Judeans who were sitting in the court of the guard. Jeremiah made a copy. He gave deeds to Baruch, and he instructed him to put the deeds in an earthenwell, uh, earthenware vessel, the same as what we found when, when we discovered the Dead Sea Scrolls, so that he could preserve them for that future day when they could be used again. And notice verse 15, For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, because one day houses and fields and vineyards shall again be bought in this land. See, Jeremiah didn't know what was going on. All he knew was that God told him to do this, and God told him to do this in the presence of witnesses, and God told him to say this whenever he did so, but Jeremiah didn't really know what was happening. See, it wasn't really Jeremiah buying this field. It was the Lord. How do I know this? How many of you in your Bibles right now, when you look at starting in verse 16, does it say, Jeremiah prays for understanding. How many of you see that in your Bible? Or see Jeremiah seeking the Lord because Jeremiah didn't really know what was happening. See, what God asked Jeremiah to do was so incredible that after he bought the field, he came back to the Lord and he prayed for understanding. Lord, you want me to buy this field? Okay, I'll go buy it. But I don't know what's happening. Go buy this field. Okay, Lord. Okay, now, why did you ask me to buy this field again? I want you to imagine a Jewish man purchasing a piece of property in Czechoslovakia right before the Nazis come in to invade in World War II. How wise would that be? I want you to imagine a couple selling all their possessions in their home because the Lord had called them as missionaries. And that one is a true story. The residents that we went to visit this last, uh, this last uh, week one of the members, one of the residents, shared that story. Her husband was a pastor. They were missionaries. And the Lord called them one day to sell everything, including their home, where they went to serve in the, in the mission field for many years. This is an amazing testimony to Jeremiah's faith. Because it tells me that he purchased the field even before he understood why God asked him to do so. See, he obeyed first, and then he asked questions later. I want you to notice Jeremiah 32, verses 24 to 45. After he purchases the field, he goes to the Lord in prayer. And he praises the Lord. He trusts in the Lord. But then he says to him in verses 24 to 25, Behold, Lord, the siege mounds have come up to the city to take it. And because of sword and famine and pestilence, the city is given into the hands of the Chaldeans who are fighting against it. What you spoke has come to pass. You asked me to buy the field, Lord, and I bought it. And behold, here you see it. Yet you, O Lord God, have said to me, buy the field for money and get witnesses, though the city is given into the hands of the Chaldeans. Everything you said has come to pass, Lord. And here we are, and you ask me to purchase this field. How often we pray for understanding, even though we already know what God has revealed to us. We know what God has said to us, what we should do but we wait until we get better understanding why how often we think that God owes us an explanation 
when he bids us to move. We already know where we should go, but we have to wait for an explanation. But God responds and he affirms to Jeremiah. The first thing he tells him is that it was necessary that this would happen. Lord, can you explain it to me? And he does, but he does so after Jeremiah has been obedient. Notice Jeremiah 32, verses 30 to 33. The Lord responds to Jeremiah, and he tells him, Jeremiah, let me tell you something. For the children of Israel and the children of Judah have done nothing but evil in my sight from their youth. The children of Israel have done nothing but provoke me to anger by the work of their hands, declares the Lord. This city has aroused my anger and wrath from the day it was built to this day so that I will remove it from my sight because of all the evil of the children of Israel and the children of Judah that they did to provoke me to anger, their kings and their officials, their priests and their prophets, the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, they have turned to me their back and not their face. And though I have taught them persistently, they have not listened to receive instruction. Everything was corrupt. Everything had to go. A lot of people may see just an angry God here. They say, what a, an angry, wrathful God, but I don't. Because I've been where the Israelites were. I've been on the wrong side of God's wrath. I've been the rebellious one at times. See, he's not just an angry God. Here I see a heartbroken father. It pains him to do this. It brings him no joy. But he's doing it because he loves them. He says, I don't want to see this. But you don't listen. You don't obey. I've been teaching you. I've been giving you my instruction. And you just throw it on the ground. You ignore it. So this must be done, Jeremiah. Jeremiah 32, 36 to 41. I want you to notice what happens next. It doesn't just stop in anger. Again, the Lord says to Jeremiah, starting in verse 36, Now therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning the city of which you say, it is given into the hand of the king of Babylon by sword, by famine, and by pestilence. Behold, I will gather them from the countries to which I drove them in my anger and my wrath. And in great indignation, I will bring them back to this place. And I will make them dwell in safety. And they shall be my people. And I will be their God. I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me forever. For their own good and the good of their children after them. I will make with them an everlasting covenant that I will not turn away from doing good to them. And I will put the fear of me in their hearts and they may not turn from me. I will rejoice in doing them good. And I will plant them in this land of faithfulness with all my heart and all my soul. I'm never going to give up on you, Jeremiah. I'm never giving up on my creatures. You may not understand what I'm doing, but I'm going to gather you together again, I promise. And out of this mess, I'm going to restore you. <laughs> and I'm going to watch you rise again. Look at verse 41. I will rejoice in doing them good. I will plant them in this land with all my heart and all my soul. I'm going to watch you rise again. And when you do, I'm going to rejoice. Okay, Lord, I got you. But what does this have to do with purchasing a field? Why'd you ask me to buy a field? <laughs> Notice verse 25. Yet you, O Lord God, have said to me, buy the field for money and get witnesses, for the city is given into the hands of the Chaldeans. Notice what he says in verse 25. God instructed him to do two things. Number one, to purchase the field. But did you notice in verse 25? Get witnesses. Did you see that? And this is what the Lord tells Jeremiah. You want to know why I asked you to buy that field, Jeremiah? Notice verses 42 to 44. Let me tell you why, Jeremiah. For thus says the Lord, Just as I have brought all this great disaster upon this people, so I will bring upon them all the good that I promised them. Fields will be bought again in this land, but what you are saying, it's a desolation. That's all you see, Jeremiah, without man or beast. And you see it's given into the hand of the Chaldeans, verse 44. 
fields shall be bought for money, and deeds shall be signed and sealed and witnessed in the land of Benjamin, in the places about Jerusalem, in the cities of Judah, in the cities of the hill country, in the cities of Shephelah, and in the cities of the Negev. For I will restore their fortunes, declares the Lord. Jeremiah, this generation is going to be removed from the land. And in about 70 years, I'm going to bring them all back together, but with a new heart and a new spirit. And the fields are going to be bought again. And this land is going to flourish again. I asked you to buy that field as a symbol of that promise. That's why I asked you to buy that field. I asked you to get witnesses because I want everybody to see it. I want everybody to hear it. I want everybody to believe it. And I want everybody to remember it so that when they're out there in the land, I want them to say, I remember that day when Jeremiah bought that field, when all hope seemed lost. He believed that he bought that field. So God revealed Jeremiah's field. And my friends, God has a field for you too. God has a field that you need to purchase as well. Did you know that? He wants you to make an investment in his promises for you. He doesn't want you just to go and inspect the field. He doesn't want you just to go and look at the field. He doesn't want you just to talk about that field. He doesn't want you just to tell people, hey, there's a field that God has for me. He wants you to buy that field. He wants you to go and weigh out your money and fill out the deed and roll it up and put it in an earthen wall vessel and believe God has given me this field. He wants you to invest in the promises that he's given to you. Not just look at it from afar. Not just admire it, but fully invest in the promises that God has for you. God has a field for you. And just like Jeremiah in verse 8, you'll know when it's God's voice. You'll know when it's God speaking to you. But if you want to purchase that field, it's going to cost you. And I'm not talking about just money. It's going to mean sacrificing your own field. Lord, I, I got this other field. It looks really nice. Look, there's a, a lake there, and I love to fish there. I, I know, but this is the field I want you to buy. But Lord, I had, I had other plans. I know you did. But this is the field I want you to buy. It's going to cost you ridicule. Because other people are going to look and say, what are you doing? That makes no sense whatsoever. You're a fool. But purchase that field anyway. It's not going to make sense, maybe even to you. Purchase that field anyway. Don't wait for an explanation. Don't wait upon the Lord God has spoken to you. You know it. Don't wait till he reveals why. No, if God has told you what to do, obey first, ask questions later. Do it like Jeremiah. Be faithful. In the darkest moment of our marriage, my wife purchased the field. When everybody said it's it's over, it's it, it go on, move on. There's there, there's nothing else here. She purchased the field. You know, the Lord said, "I believe in this marriage." The Lord says, "I've got something bigger in store." She purchased the field when everybody else said she was foolish, and she not only saved our marriage, she saved my life. And I have no doubt that this church would not be here if it hadn't been for her buying that field. Lee and Tony Kaufman, they purchased the field. When they were on the brink of divorce, they both invested their lives, and their family, and their marriage, everything in Christ. And today they stand as a testimony that all things are possible for those who believe. Amen. Stephen Veronica Lanza purchased the field. When the Lord called them to leave New York, to come to Texas, they left their family and everything they knew, all the comforts of home, to follow where the Lord said, go this way. And the Lord blessed Steve with a new job and a new career, and he blessed their family with a new home, and he blessed this church with a great addition to our flock. Ryan Bush purchased the field. Ryan uh, moved to Texas. He didn't even know where he was going to live. you got to hear his story. It's an amazing story. All he knew was that Julia was in Texas. And that's where God wanted him to go. And so he came. And he drove down from Wyoming in his car and all his possessions there, not knowing he was going to get here and he was going to look for a place to live, not knowing where he was going to live. And when he got here, the Lord provided for him. Amen. To this day, he still lives out of his car. I'm just joking. <laughs> <laughs> they have a beautiful home. 
my friends, I could go on and on. I've heard your stories. I could hear the, I, I could tell you about the fields you've all purchased. And it's not going to be just one time. God is going to call you to invest in his promises. He's going to have uh, fields for you to purchase. I could go on and on. But the message is clear. When God calls you to purchase a field, don't lose that opportunity. Don't lose that blessing. Think about it. This story is here because Jeremiah bought that field. Imagine if one of the brothers, imagine if one of the others before had done it. They would have been preserved in God's word for all time. And they missed it. They missed it because they had no eyes of faith. They didn't see the opportunity that the Lord had provided for them. Don't let that opportunity pass you by. I promise that if God has given to you that field, there's no better field. No matter how crazy it must look, there's no better option. No matter how difficult it must seem, you have to trust in that investment. And I'll leave you with this. Everything in Scripture points to Jesus Christ, even in the Old Testament. And I want to prove it to you here. I want you to notice, when the Lord promises Jeremiah that he's going to restore the land, he tells them in Jeremiah chapter 33, verse 3, Call to me, and I will answer you, and I will tell you great and hidden things that you have not known. He says to him, Jeremiah, you don't see everything. But, you know, you did what I asked you to do. And you came to me in fervent prayer. So I'm going to re reveal to you some hidden things, some beautiful things. And then he tells them, Jeremiah, when that day comes, when everybody comes back, I want you to notice what he says in verse 11 of chapter 33. When that day comes, the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride, the voices of those who sing as they bring thank offerings to the house of the Lord will occur. He says, Jeremiah, on that day when I gather my people again, you're going to hear the voice of the bridegroom and the bride, and everybody's going to rejoice. Go with me to John chapter 3, verses 27 to 29. John chapter 3, verses 27 to 29, when John the Baptist begins his ministry. And they come and they ask him, hey, what's going on here? This, this man, Jesus of Nazareth, he's, he's baptizing more than you. He's becoming more popular than you. Shouldn't we do something? And John the Baptist says, and he answered, a person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I'm not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom, that's all I am, who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is complete. He must increase, but I must decrease. The voice of the bridegroom is now heard. And the bride, his church, rejoices. Go back with me to Jeremiah 33, 14 to 16, and we'll close with this. Jeremiah 33, 14 to 16. The Lord continues to reveal the hidden things. And he says to him, Jeremiah, behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will fulfill the promise I made to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. And in, th in those days, and at that time, I will cause a righteous branch to spring up for David. And he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. And in those days, Judah will be saved. And Jerusalem will dwell securely. And this is the name by which it will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. You know what the, the name in Hebrew is for, for a branch? Nasser. Like a Nazarene. <clears throat> My friends, Jeremiah had to purchase this field at a time when there was no hope. There was no future. But the fields that we purchase, they're sure. They're guaranteed. We don't have to put them in an earthenware pot and, and wait till one day. The day is now. We live in the day of the Lord. Because the day of the Lord has arrived. His promises have been fulfilled in Christ. And his righteous branch now reigns. You can guarantee that that, that field that God has for you. 
can guarantee that it's the greatest purchase you could ever invest in. And God has put this in my heart. There's someone watching online that is supposed to be sitting here with us now. There's someone watching online that the field that you're supposed to purchase is the fellowship of this community. And God is calling you to purchase that field and make your way here. We're going we're gonna to have a, a nice meal after we finish. And you should be sharing that meal with us. God has called you to purchase a field. Don't wait. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share with you that if the field that God has for you to purchase is the decision that you put and place your faith and trust in Jesus, then today can be that day. Maybe the field you're supposed to purchase is the first and foremost field, the field of faith in Christ. Because from there, all other fields follow. But if you don't buy that and purchase that field first, nothing else will matter. So I'm going to ask if you'll please stand with me. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. If there's anyone here, if there's anyone watching online, if the Lord has led you to purchase a field, where, whatever it is in your life, and most importantly, if that field that you're supposed to purchase is faith and surrender of your life to Christ, then make that today. Don't wait. Don't lose opportunity. Don't be the one that's forgotten to history and that's lost to eternity because you were too afraid to take that step. Let's go to the Lord. And if you have that conviction and you have a decision you want to make, if you have a prayer, if you have a, a, a decision to make, come forward and just pray here. This isn't about us. This is about the Lord. This is between you and God. And if you need personal prayer, we have deacons here. But don't wait. Let's go to the Lord. Lord, Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day. And I thank you for the message and the example that you left us in Jeremiah. Lord, you purchased that field. What Jeremiah did in his act of obedience was to remind his people, Lord Father, that your promises are always guaranteed. A reminder that no matter how bleak things get, no matter how difficult things look, you don't leave us there. You always have a greater purpose for us. And Lord, we know that sometimes difficulties arise and it's difficult to experience those things. And we can wonder, Lord, what are you doing? But we have to have faith and trust that in all things you're working for the greater good. And we know, Lord, that you don't forget us. You love us. And that when we rise, that you're going to watch us rise and you're going to rejoice. And so, Lord, today I pray that if there's any decision that anyone here has been dealing with, if there's a, a field that you've called them to purchase and they've been delaying, maybe they've been waiting for, for a confirmation, maybe they're waiting for an explanation, maybe it doesn't make sense, Lord Father, give them the peace and the comfort and the <coughs> knowledge that you call them to obedience first. Obey first, ask questions later. So, Lord, I pray that if there's anyone that's been dealing with the decision, with the purchase of a field in their life, Lord Father, Strengthen them and guide them and affirm and convict them of that. And Lord, if there's anyone, Lord, that hasn't made that decision to purchase the first and foremost field, the one where they place their hope, their faith, and their trust in your son, Jesus, Lord, Father, I pray that today they can make that decision and say, Lord, I'm a sinner. Lord, I have not been living according to your will. Lord, I've been on the outskirts. And today, Lord, I surrender my life. I acknowledge that without your son, I am doomed. I'm I, I'm I'm destined, Lord Father, to, to eternal hell. But Lord, today I invest in that field. And I make the greatest purchase anyone could ever make. That field of promise, that field of eternal salvation that is bought only with the blood of your son, Jesus Christ. And Lord, I pray that if anyone has made that prayer, if anyone has said those words, Lord Father, may you bless them and be with them. May your spirit render, Lord Father, that conviction. And that they may find themselves with a, a good Bible-based church, whether it's here or wherever you send them, Lord Father, that they may continue to walk in the effects of that decision. Lord, I thank you for this day and for this message. And I pray, Lord, that in all that we do, that this church always invests everything, every field that we invest, Lord Father, is yours. So that you may be glorified in all that we do. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless you. I hope that this message uh, blessed you in your life. And uh, as we dismiss, uh, do not leave because we've got food and we've got fellowship. So I'm going to ask that um, if, if the ladies and the kids will step out and just enjoy a little bit of fellowship, I'm going to ask that the men help me.
we're going to uh, get set up and we're going